Good afternoon. I'm Rosemary Laverty. I'm a partner at Dilworth Paxson in Philadelphia, and I am president of Crew Philadelphia. I wanted to thank everyone for attending this afternoon for our virtual event, Predicting Wellness and Sustainability in Future Commercial Real Estate, particularly our members and sponsors who are attending because we truly appreciate your support. We believe it's important to recognize our annual sponsors, so Laura McLean will be identifying them by name. I hope you'll bear with us as we do that. And I also want to thank Laura for coordinating our program and for our panelists who will be introduced shortly. Laura? But thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we even have some attendees from some other crew chapters. So um, I'm really excited about that. And also just a, a very large number of uh, Crew Philadelphia guests with us today. So just thank you uh, to everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is Laura McLean. I am the communications co-chair with Crew Philadelphia, um, as well as the director of business development for JL Architects. Uh, so thank you all again. And um, before we get started, I just wanted to share a few really quick announcements with you um, in order to make the most effective use of our time together. So as Rosemary stated, uh, you know, we really could not do what we do every year, uh, especially during pandemics, without the support of our members and especially our annual sponsors. So I just really wanted to go through this list of our annual sponsors and thank each and every one of these firms uh, individually because they really do uh, help us just be who we are every single year. Uh, so Bercadia is our premier lead sponsor. Our skyscraper sponsors are Dilworth Paxton, Whispers Bank, Brandywine Realty Trust, White & Williams, Capstan Tax, Herman Miller, Target Building and Construction, Scenario, KSS Architects, and First American Title Insurance Company, Commercial Real Estate Division. Our high-rise sponsors are Skanska, Spectrum, Fox Rothschild, O'Donnell Nacarado, J. Davis Architects, NFI Industries, Brookfield Properties, Fidelity National Title and Chicago Title Insurance Company, Irwin and Layton, Archer Attorneys at Law, Clemens Construction, and Elliott Lewis. Our groundbreaker sponsors are Equus Capital Partners, Greyhawk Construction, Hayworth, Land Services USA, and NV5 Bach and Clark. And our affiliate sponsors are Advantage Sport and Fitness, Court, Interface, Rethink Innovations, and Transamerican Office Furniture. So thank you all again. Um, you know, we have many of our panelists today are from those sponsor firms and many of our attendees today are from those sponsor firms. And just thank you all so much for everything that you do for us. And we certainly do uh, all strive to work together as members and sponsors of Crew Philadelphia every day. So thank you so much. Um, I wanted to let you all know that this event is being recorded. Uh, and the recording will be emailed to all registrants, along with any follow-up and reference materials that are requested from any of the panelists. Um, and each of you uh, as attendees are automatically muted, so please don't worry about any background noise um, on your side. We're all completely understanding at this point of barking dogs and curious kids. Um, in order to communicate with us a little bit effectively during this time, um, Aurora demonstrated that she is a champion with this, but we do have the chat feature. Uh, that I will be monitoring throughout the event. Uh, if you want to just drop a quick note. Um, and for questions, you can ask questions anytime during the event. We'll be addressing questions at the end of the event, uh, but feel free to ask questions either directed to a particular panelist um, or to all panelists if you'd like by utilizing the Q&A feature. Um, and then finally, we just encourage you, I'm the communications co-chair, so I have to say this, uh, but please share your thoughts and your takeaways from today's events on social media. You can find Crew Philadelphia on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, and please use hashtag Crew Philly in order to connect with us. Um, and many of our panelist firms today are also on social media, so feel free to tag them as well and give them the due recognition that they certainly deserve. Uh, so with that, I'm very pleased to introduce today's panelists who are going to discuss, as Rosemary mentioned, commercial real estate uh, in various industries as we continue to return to normal operations post-coronavirus. Uh, so our first speaker today is with JL Architects. As founding principal of JL Architects, John Lister is nationally licensed and leads his team in strategic planning, design, construction management, and sustainable practices. Founded in 1988, JL Architects is a full-service commercial architecture firm leveraging emerging technologies and cutting-edge design to meet the unique needs of each of our clients. And during his presentation, John will discuss the resilience and sustainability in the context and, co 
and constantly changing reality of the pandemic. Our second speaker will be Stacy Boston from Hayworth, who brings over 17 years of experience in the commercial interiors industry, currently serving as the Mid-Atlantic Regional Director for Hayworth, as well as a board member for Crew Philadelphia. Hayworth is a global leader in contract furnishing industry, improving workplaces with award-winning furniture, interior architecture, and technology solutions in more than 170 countries. In her presentation, Stacy will cover returning to the workplace uh, considerations, including employee well-being, organizational culture, transforming the floor plate, and remote work considerations. <clears throat> Our third speaker today is Kim Hamilton with Advantage Sport, Sport and Fitness, who is a project specialist in collaboratively creating fitness amenities within commercial real estate clients, in addition to instructing trainers on fitness programming as a master trainer for Escape Fitness, which is an Advantage vendor partner. Since 1987, Advantage Sport and Fitness has provided a full selection of fitness equipment solutions, as well as spatial design consultations, exercise-friendly flooring, professional equipment installation, and maintenance services in nine states along the East Coast. Kim will share insights on creating short-term and long-term strategies for reopening fitness facilities at existing properties, as well as designing fitness amenities for future development pro pro <laughs> projects. I was doing so good. Um, Hillman Consulting will be uh, led by Chris Baker, who oversees their field and technical services nationwide, providing environmental consulting, conducting field testing, site inspections, and creating and reviewing protocols, reports, and programs for clients. Hillman Consulting has been providing environmental health and safety, construction risk management, and owner's rep representation services since 1985. Chris will review his insights to help clients figure out <clears throat> how to get and stay operational in a COVID world, including building usage, cleaning, and social distancing within an operational building. Tony DeLeonardo, I was the one to mess it up, Tony, I'm sorry. <laughs> Tony DeLeonardo is the vice president, of, is the president, wow, of Wick Fisher White, whose expertise includes mechanical, plumbing, fire protection, and building commissioning, which he also presents to audiences nationwide. Founded in 1901, Wick Fisher White is an award-winning multidiscipline engineering firm that specializes in MEP and fire protection design, as well as commissioning for building systems in a wide array of market sectors. Tony will be discussing the potential impact of COVID-19 on building systems and how to design for better buildings and cleaner environments moving forward. And lastly, Nathan Dennis, the Vice President of Operations with Target Building and Construction has been with them for 22 years. Target Building and Construction is a family-oriented or organization for more than 30 years, providing differentiated services throughout the Mid-Atlantic region. Nathan will touch on the changes in construction industry, keeping workers and trade partners safe on job sites, policy and procedure changes to keep field employees informed, and looking into the future to adjust within our industry. So that was a mouthful, I apologize. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to turn it over to our first panelist, John Lister. And again, please utilize the chat and the Q&A features throughout the presentation. So thank you all again for being here and John, take it away. Oh, hang on, John, you are unmuted and I unmuted the wrong John, there you go. Okay, um, very good. Thank you, Laura, and welcome everyone. Um, Predicting wellness and sustainability in the future uh, in the uh, world that we know as post-coronavirus, hopefully. Um, I'm an architect and a sustainability consultant. I have um, licenses all over the country, and I'm also a credit professional and as a Green Globes professional and as a lead AP. So the sustainability part works very well in and dovetails very closely with wellness, uh, which is something which I think a lot of people misunderstand. So let's talk about a little bit about uh, where we are and getting over the coronavirus. Um, we, I, th I see that there are two ways that we're going to get through this. Uh, one is a mo an emotional solution, which I think we're all going to have to deal with on our own level and uh, getting to the comfort level again that we will have to uh, go back to our day-to-day -day life, whatever normal looks like, you know, six months from now, because it probably won't look the same as it did three months ago. The other part is from a scientific standpoint, which is very objective. It's the easiest way to deal with things. Uh, we understand this to be a disease. We know that there will be a, a vaccine. We know that masks and social distancing and you know staying home and watching lots of webinars are good ways to keep ourselves from becoming infected and infecting other people. Um, there's a lot of apprehension along with this particular event simply because 
Um, I guess for me, the most, the greatest one is that I can be infected and not know it for a week and infect everybody around me. So testing and so on is a very difficult thing and, and managing that. On the upside, um, we know that we can get through this. In the past, there have been things that we have uh, taken out of buildings and they include asbestos and PCBs and lead and paint and so on that we thought for a long time we couldn't live without. Um, at this point, of course, I can't imagine putting asbestos or lead in, in buildings any longer. So we're going to kind of, you know, come to a new normal and we will adjust and that will, you know, life will go on. Um, another thing, and this uh, strikes to the wellness aspect, is that people have become more aware of what they do with the extra time that they have. And uh, I think I started realizing about a month ago how remarkable it was that we were able to basically take most of the cars off the road and find out what would happen. And um, we found that uh, in this particular case, people are at great risk who has re respiratory or at higher risk who have respiratory issues. And those things are contributed to by uh, air pollution and smoking and so on. And then people are also taking the, the um, opportunity with all the time they have on their hands to be more active and to exercise and, and to cook more and so on. And so I think a lot of these things are going to, um, they can be cha uh, behavior changes and for the better. And I think as we look forward uh, in life, we'll probably find that if they stick, we will be all the better for it. And that is what progress is. So, um, Interesting thing this morning, I was coming to the office and I was listening to a report about Los Angeles and everybody knows I am a, a Southern California native. I went to college in LA and I remember driving back and forth between school and Santa Monica for two years and every day there was a notice on the, on the freeway that said, unhealthful air tomorrow, stay indoors if you can. That was every day for two years. Well, they took the cars off the road and they found out that the ozone level only went down by 10%. It's about the trucks and deliveries. So this is kind of a takeaway. They would never have figured that out. And now they're talking about the port of Los Angeles changing to electric vehicles um, because they found that that's where the ozone is coming from. And that's where a, a smaller amount of soot, but nonetheless the ozone, which is very damaging and, and harmful. So um, moving on then to sustainability and resilience. Resilience is a, is a uh, buzzword which is becoming much and much, uh, much more popular. And we're finding it to be more popular because we have things like this happening. We have the COVID, we have a hurricane, we have you know, shooters and that sort of stuff, active shooters in, in workplaces and school places and that sort of stuff. So resiliency is the ability to spring back from an event, um, frequently traumatic, and it can be any of those things. So it's the ability not only to, to, to restore where you were, but more importantly, um, it's the ability to prevent the same thing from happening again. So it's being proactive and looking towards the future. Sustainability is, is um, something that we hear about a lot. We hear about most the, a term mostly with respect to green building certifications, which we're very active in. But it's meeting the needs of the present without compromising the opportunities for the future. We're not using everything up and damaging everything, which prevents our children and our grandchildren and so on from being able to um, have the same opportunities to excel and grow that we have had. So that's where a lot of things about um, energy conservation, uh, renewable resources, whether it be wood or it be um, uh, renewable electricity and that sort of stuff, that's where that comes from. So um, I want to jump into something because I think about how we're going to have peace of mind looking forward. And we go into public settings, we have retail stores, we have restaurants, we have our, our, our uh, place of business, we have those sporting events that we're got going to. We're probably gonna miss the Super Bowl championship uh, parade for the Eagles this year. Um, you know, that was gonna happen. We know it was gonna happen, but who knows if there's gonna be a football season. And even if they win it, will it count? Because will there really be 18 games? I don't know. So. I don't know, the Patriots will probably have an asterisk. Any case, um, so let me share a few things which has have come, uh, let's see how well I do with this. I think I'm doing it. Um, so we have high touch areas and that goes for uh, places that we do at work where we go and we recreate even, uh, you know, if we go to the stadium where we go to the concert hall, we go, you know, all these places. So. Um, the image that you see here is about waving to open a door. 
Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the buttons on the wall that um, are for uh, opening doors for the handicap. Well, you still have to touch that, and that's where that potential contamination comes from. So now there are proximity sensors, so you don't have to touch that. Um, and it's just one more thing. Oops. Uh, there. So when I say oops, you know I goofed. Um, on the left-hand side is an occupancy sensor. Um, it's something that you don't have to touch to turn the lights on and off. And, not only, and you don't have to wave your arms either because it not only senses motion, but also that there's something there. So um, I don't have to wave my arms at night when I'm sitting here working by myself and the lights keep going off. Um, I believe Stacy has one of these keys on the right-hand side. It's made out of brass, which is a, a naturally, um, it resists contaminants naturally by its inherent properties as being brass. But you see it's used for opening doors with that hook. It's used for pushing buttons, which don't have proximity sensors. So it's just an adaption of, or adaptation for how do I not touch that? Um, I mentioned the Americans with Disabilities Act earlier. I become acutely aware of how to wash my hands in the last two months and how to open doors without grabbing the handle. But these are people with handicaps and disabilities who've been learned for a long time. So actually the images that you see here are out of the Americans with Disabilities Act. How do I open doors without touching it with the thing that I'm gonna shake your hand or where I'm going to continue to you know, touch my mouse or type on my keyboard? But you, you, know, you, open a, you, you use a, a closed fist to open the door, um, whether you're pulling up that like you see on the left hand side, use your elbow or your forehand to, to, to turn on and off water. Um, also proximity sensors, motion sensors for soap, for paper towels you see on the next one. The one on the left, uh, you know, I'm sure we've been frustrated by the water that won't come on or go, go off or that sort of thing. They're getting much better. This one is actually even better because um, it's actually solar powered. So the light in the bathroom makes that work. Um, as an architect, we put these in a lot of times, but our clients always push back when they say, oh, we got to run electricity. So we have solved that problem. Um, this again, the, the uh, paper towel dispenser. These are all things where I can stop touching things again, and then the pull bar there so I can do it with a f closed fist. Um, I was searching for things about, you know, how do we move forward? What's the new reality? The Washington Post thinks this is what airline travel looks like. Um, so I'm wondering what it's like. I mean, I don't know what do you, how about you guys, but when the guy in front of me reclines his, his uh, chair, I can imagine that piece of plexiglass being in my face, not my lap. Um, but, and I don't know what it's like to get in and out to, to the window seat, but um, you know, this is what they think. And that means the middle seat's not occupied and we're not breathing on each other. Restaurants of the future. Um, I don't really know how you not eat through other than a straw with this, but this is another Washington Post uh, or New York Post, excuse me. But there's lots of things. And actually something that you might not notice is these people are actually the servers. These are not the people who are eating. So those boards that you see there are is that board that you see there. It's actually what they serve the food to guests on. And all the guests are sitting in their own little um, tents and they dine by themselves. I believe this is actually in um, uh, Amsterdam uh, and it's predominantly for weather, but this also uh, keeps people away from one another so they're not you know, trading pathogens, but it's still, it's, it's still a, um, another way. Um, more adaptations so that we're not breathing on one another. One of the keys here is that they don't breathe on each other, but when I think about the grocery store, there's the, uh, you know, who doesn't, who under 12 doesn't touch that, who under 12 doesn't touch this screen that's between the customer and the clerk. So long-term cleaning is something that we need to focus on. And um, there are products out there which are very helpful and do that and really relieve a lot of things. Um, what office space looks like and how we uh, uh, keep away from one another. Um, these are things which are very common and maybe this is what things start looking like. Uh, on the right hand side you see you know a, a shared workspace where people are lined up one, and, one from the other and across from each other, a perfect way to share things but uh, uh, meaning uh, germs and disease. Uh, but on the left hand side if you look carefully the the workspaces are a little bit further apart but because the chairs can be arranged, we can sit at the tables, collaborate, but not necessarily be everybody exchanging germs in the same way. So it's positioning and it's just thinking about things in that respect. Um, so 
moving. Oh, there it is. I knew I'd figured it out. There we go. So moving on, those things that address a lot of things that have to do with you know high touch areas, different environments in what you're going to do, you're gonna uh, um, engage with people. I wanna to turn to the office space because we're seeing and hearing a lot of things about office space and large companies like JP Morgan and Twitter and, and the like who have hundreds of thousands of square feet of space and they've sent everybody home and the CEO is telling everybody, hey, by the way, you're not coming back ever not just you know in september not in october not in 2021 just never and there's upsides and downsides to that and i think they're finding that a lot of people are well obviously there's an upside is they don't pay rent on hundreds of thousands of square feet of prime office space but the other part is they think that people are being more productive and they have their quiet space and so on um, i happen to know that a lot of people um i'm sure a lot of people who are on this webinar understand that that quiet space at home is not really that quiet um, so there are trade-offs there. Uh, the other thing is, in the people that I've spoken to, very unscientific, but people that I've spoken to um, are, um, uh, they like the idea of working from home, but they also like the idea that they don't have to work from home, that they have the option. There's a collaboration effect, there's, there's um, company culture, there's learning to, to know your coworkers, and um, personally, I prefer the real happy hour to the virtual happy hour. I mean, that's a huge thing. That's how you get to know people. That's who we work with. Those are our colleagues and, and our friends. Um, taking this and, and the awareness of sustainability and things, and there's a, uh, with um, the increased awareness and uh, sensitivity to uh, wellness, it brings to mind uh, a number of aspects that are in sustainability, uh, which are clean air and in water. Um, conservation of water, natural light, um, the idea of circadian rhythm and the light coming up and going down during the day, acoustics, which I'm sure again people on the webinar can uh, appreciate, you know, it's not always quiet uh, and you do need quiet places, but you also need to, to have uh, things that you, spare, you share with one another. Um, so I guess um, ready for resilience, uh, moving into that, um, things are not going to be normal again. Um, I think what we need to do to be prepared for the next one is to um, have to establish a level of comfort and confidence that we can handle this the next time, that there's going to be medical knowledge regarding treatment, that there'll be pre preparation in advance with PPE and, &E and, and um, um, medical facilities and that they see this coming. Um, Consumers will demand better workspaces and better buildings to live in um, and better and greater provisions for the future for the next time something like this happens. Um, and then also we've obviously found out that, you know, there are alternate uh, workplaces that we can work from as everybody on the panel knows uh, and everybody at home. Um, and then lastly, the ability to use materials, whether they be new materials or existing materials to resist pathogens and the transmission of pathogens as we move forward. So I'm pretty sure that I've ran out of, run out of time or overstayed my welcome. So um, I will give it on then to uh, Stacy Boston and let her take over. Okay, great. Um, thanks everyone. Can someone just give me a thumbs up that you can see my screen? Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is um, Stacy Boston, so thanks for joining us. I'm the uh, Mid-Atlantic Regional Director for Hayworth, and I'm gonna talk today about Hayworth's point of view for returning to the workplace. And I think it's important to note that I didn't say returning to work um, because we all have been working. Um, and as states start to open up, we need to help companies transition back to the workplace. So we closed our offices, we turned our homes into the workplace and finding that balance um, of how to create personal interaction with virtual collaboration is critical for our well-being. Um, every organization is seeking to understand what short and long-term changes they need to implement from facilities needs to work rotations, um, possibly sequenced returns of the workforce and they're challenged with um, sustaining their cultures while keeping people safe, confident, and effective. 
So we, we feel it's really important to take more of an integrated view um, when we're helping our customers return to the workplace. And Hayworth has identified three critical areas to focus on. The first being employee well-being, so both the physical and the psychological health, um, also organizational culture, and then um, looking at how to transform the floor plate. So we know companies want to create a solution that ensures that people can perform their best. They want to support their culture. Um, they want to leverage the existing products that they have, um, which is going to enable them to reconfigure with ease and at a reduced cost. And so we do this by really looking at that entire floor plate. So where the interaction and collaboration is happening all the way down to the individual work points. So the easiest things for organization, organizations to think about is the idea of remote work. Um, so before you even think about purchasing new furniture solutions and products, it's important to really understand who's going to be coming back into the workplace in that short term. And as John mentioned, some companies uh, like JP Morgan are saying they're not. Um, some companies have found that a lot of individuals and departments can perform their jobs from home just as efficiently as they can in the office. And they may choose to have them remain home in this short term. So this is then gonna allow companies to spread their people out throughout the floor plate, either by um, moving to every other workstation um, or reassigning some of the unassigned spaces to an individual or a team. So one framework that um, we developed is the affordance framework. And affordances are elements of the workspace that influence the physical, the cognitive, and the emotional needs of people. Um, our studies and research identified 10 affordances that are vital to human performance. So during this unique time, the affordances that relieve stress and provide security are gonna take precedence when people are really challenged with this new way of working. So when adjusting the workspace for physical distancing, um, five key affordances should really be taken into consideration and prioritized. And those are well-being, insulation, affinity, access, and movement. So I'm just gonna touch on the first two because I know we're kind of short on time. Um, so um, these are characteristics of a space that enable optimal human, uh, human performance, both as I said, cognitively, emotionally, and physically. Um, and they're really building confidence, which is important. So um, how can we address this idea of well-being? Um, we want to create spaces that inspire and that allow for recovery. So this could be simple things like access to daylight, um, providing retreat spaces, uh, leveraging some outdoor spaces and allowing our workers to actually work outside. Um, just giving employees a sense of control by allowing them to move throughout the floor plate if they choose. So the second affordance I'm gonna to touch on is this idea of insulation. Um, the ability to focus is gonna be affected by this um, high level of stress. Um, this stress could be due to um, maybe technology that people aren't used to, um, a lot of distractions, extra noise. Um, just the idea of being in the office is going to be very stressful for some individuals. Um, so we can address this through this vertical division. So things like panels, screens, um, even storage solutions, um, or by simply uh, changing the orientation. So changing the way people are facing to give them a little bit more confidence. So the second big bucket that I think we need to touch on is the idea of organizational culture. So preserving your company's um, unique culture is really essential during this time of uncertainty. Um, culture is the backbone of any company, and we want to make sure we don't lose this culture that companies have worked so hard to create. Um, culture is made up of your company values, any assumptions, artifacts, you know, the way you dress, things like that. Um, so when developing your return to the workplace plan, um, it's really important to think about what people value and how that's going to affect space. So a couple ways to do this is um, plan a regular communication program to preserve the health, um, reinforce culture, drive effective space, um, space use. Um, also, you want to support employee mo mobility and choice um, to kind of increase that idea of control for where they can work. 
Um, and then also it's important to reinforce your company culture. Um, you are probably communicating more now in this virtual environment than you ever did before. Um, so use this as a chance to reinforce your val values um, that your company was built on and then leverage any uh, group work technologies. So um, it's also important to note that you really want to make these changes with care. You want to try not to go too far away um, from what your current culture is. Um, you want to create solutions that are going to work with your culture type. So for instance, um, if you're a create or collaborate culture, which I think a lot of um, our organizations probably are, design firms, designers, um, your people are not going to do well if you put them in, in private offices and 80 inch high uh, workstations. So um, if your people are used to an environment like you see here, um, you want to still allow your employees to collaborate, but you just might need to make some changes. So. Um, you know, maybe moving, uh, removing some of the, um, the seating options there on the right, getting rid of that collaboration table, adding some of these dividers at the work point, but it's still kind of preserving that, that company culture. People who work in this environment would die in an environment of 80 inch high work panels. So you have to be really important not to swing the pendulum too far. So let's um, jump into some quick examples of how to transform your floor plates. So we want to look at all areas of the floor plate from the workstations, the private offices, to the huddle rooms, conference rooms, um, all of the unassigned collaboration areas. So you can see here in blue is where we have these assigned spaces. So think about, you know, how many people need to come back into the office and how can we shift some of those unassigned spaces into assigned spaces, start to spread those employees out across the, the floor plate. Um, and how can you reduce maybe the amount of people that might have used that 12 person conference room, maybe it's now a four person conference room, maybe that conference room shifted from unassigned to assigned. So you can see here now, now we've taken um, the entire floor plate and turned them into more assigned areas. Um, and I'm just going to run through a couple, you know, quick examples because um, I know we all love to see, you know, fun pictures. So um, here's some, some ideas of, you know, current state. So in the short term, easiest thing to do here is let's remove some of those stools down the center. Um, that controls the occupancy. We're going to remove some of the work tools um, and accessories at the workstation to make it easier to clean. And then that long-term solution is we're going to shift the storage around. We're going to add some glass toppers to those panels for a little bit more um, security. So here's a benching application. Um, so again, short term, easiest thing is to say, you know what, this is going to go from a six pack to a four pack. We're going to remove some of those users. Long term, we're going to add some gallery panels. We're going to add some screens um, because we need to keep that density, um, but we want to make it safe um, for our employees. Um, here, another example of um, benching, we're just going to quickly, you know, for the short term, let's get rid of those guest seatings. The pedestals um, are going to be removed so that we're not allowing any more um, users into that area. Long term, it's shifting from um, the, let's see, that's an eight pack to a six pack. It's adding a little bit more um, divider screens, um, so it's changing that occupancy. Uh, for private offices, um, we're going to remove some of those guest chairs. We'll reposition them so that you still can have two people in that office, but they're just spread out a little bit more. And that long term is just shifting it so it's really more just a, um, a person who's going to be in there for a brief moment of time. Um, we've heard a lot of interesting things about conference rooms. So removing the doors of conference rooms promotes airflow. It's also, as John had touched, it's one less thing to touch. Um, there's fewer chairs, which is going to support physical distancing. Um, and then we added the tables on casters, which gives some uh, mobility and user control. And then finally, we have an idea of a cafe. Um, so we kind of shifted this to single seats, which is going to provide proper distancing. Um, we added some additional space between the booths, but you still can have um, that group interaction within that shared space. A lot of information in a really short time. Um, so my contact information is there. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to let me know. And I am going to kick it over to Kim Hamilton from Advantage Sport and Fitness. And I should have stopped sharing. So give me a thumbs up if it's good. Good. Okay. Awesome.
Thank you, Stacy. I did not bring fun pictures. <laughs> um, I do have fun pictures, though, um, if you want to follow up with me of just about some of the things I'm going to be talking about. But um, when I talk to my colleagues in the commercial real estate industry and they we talk about this idea of well being, they kind of look at me and they're like, oh, yeah, the fitness equipment people exercise. I need to exercise. That means healthy, and that's it. Um, but I think what you're noticing from the panelists already is that there's this more holistic approach. And even more so now that's kind of being incorporated is this idea of hygiene as being part of health and well being, and whether that's your personal self with masks and gloves, or whether it's the things that you're doing within your facility. Um, and we're kind of taking our knowledge that we're learning from the larger portion of the club industry and taking it to our developers and designers that are on projects. I think that you will find um, that clubs aren't going to open up as fast as I'm sure everyone that's doing their quarantine workouts uh, want, um, but that some of the building operations and facilities will open up just a little bit sooner. And so kind of how are you going to be prepared for that? Um, there are clubs opening up in the U.S., but in Pennsylvania, if you're in the red phase or the yellow phase, which is most of the entire state, your recreational areas are not open yet and don't plan to be. Um, and even as they move to the green phase um, in Pennsylvania, at the very least, and some other states, there isn't, there's kind of like this ambiguity of what's going to happen as far as like being in a fitness center, and it's really going to be kind of on you as the owner and the operator um, to kind of provide this like as again like this emotional kind of sense of well-being as well as these parameters um so in the us as i was saying in clubs that are happening already and what we're seeing in layouts and things that we're doing with things that are or projects that are developing within the next like or delivering within the next six months um as well as people that are like planning about a year out and whether they're delivering in we're kind of taking these layouts that we have currently and doing short-term plans and long-term plans and then back to short-term plans again. Um, so within facilities right now, what we're focusing on, of course, is developing these six-foot parameters in a facility. And what's happening is we are doing like six-foot kind of measurements on each piece of equipment and setting cardio away uh, from those kind of midpoints so people aren't interacting, kind of like John was showing like as far as those guards in the seats on the airplanes, you'll start to see some of those in different fitness amenities too. I'm sure that's going to be interesting kind of running on a treadmill in this little itty bitty kind of uh, panels, but you'll start to see those in clubs as well and could potentially be in any fitness amenity that you're providing in one of your buildings. Um, we are removing pieces of cardio from layouts right now and then big also taping parameters off, which has to be kind of aesthetically pleasing still. You know, you don't want to have tape all over the floors, of course. Um, and as far as like large training rooms, if you had a Group X room in any of your current um, places, those rooms aren't going to be really occupied, you know, um, for quite some time. You know, it's kind of like those concerts and all of that. Putting people sweaty in in as close uh, space is, is not going to happen for a while. Um, something to immediately think about is if you are, and I bring this from the campus rec side, um, and so is that the showers are shutting down everywhere and no one's going to be able to really use them. However, in campus rec, they understand that people really need those showers if they're going to start to open up um, those facilities again, and they need kind of that service. So those are things that you're going to have to think about if you are going to offer those um, for people that can make commute to any of your buildings or really rely on that service as they come back to the workplace or to your building. Um, and good old fashioned sign up sheets are going to kind of come up into play. Um, if you do have an integrated technology, you know, there will be this whole fob system of letting people in and letting people out and kind of being able to control that occupancy. Um, but those kind of parameters are starting with like a 5.30 sign up, I'm gonna be in the shower at six, and then there's gonna be like a 45 minute cleaning kind of gap in between. I think that's what you're gonna find is that people wanna feel that you're keeping them safe and we talk about these like high level of communications, they're gonna be that way with all of the cleaning that you're doing as well. Um, and that's gonna be a lot of your communal spaces as well as fitness amenities. Um, 
Also, just in general, things that are going to happen for a while now are these hygiene stations, right? These hand sanitizers and places to wash your hands and disposables of getting new gloves or face masks. Um, we are ramping up and um, right now our hygiene products are kind of like your toilet paper and your um, paper towels. You're, they're uh, not on good supply and they take a really long time to get. Um, so get yourself an order. Um, but there's also these all new cleaning kind of measurements, you know, electrostatic is happening quite often now. And that's going to be something that building operators will probably be doing on their own. But these are just short term things. And so what's going to happen in the long term? And how do we think about that as far as fitness amenities go? And, you know, as everyone's saying too, these workout regimes that people may not have had, they've had a lot of free time now, or maybe not, but they've been at least been at home. Um, so this whole idea of working out and getting more exercise and movement is kind of ramping up. So I think that what you will start to see in the industry overall and in building kind of designs are like individualized stations that make it easier for you to come in, do a sign up, have someone come in and clean afterwards and then leave. Um, that'll probably happen for quite some time. And then, but within these fitness centers and within these amenities and even in different buildings, it's still trying to create this sense of community in your workplace and out of that. And so I think that corporations are going to have to get uh, more creative with the way that they offer that. Um, I think not as builders, but as corporate tenants, you'll start to see some people incorporate more apps and kind of as part of their HR well-being program for them to use. Um, and then being able to integrate that and use that in their fitness amenity itself. And so that'll be kind of upcoming. Um, we are finally installing again, and so that's been a very interesting process too. But we are ready to like kind of move forward and get people moving again. And as John said, you know, people are, uh, they are taking on all new sense of um, working out in that movement kind of piece. But that's kind of all I have for today. I mean, there's, many more kind of design features I have of the way that we are creating layouts for um, and accommodating layouts for COVID right now for short term and long term. And now I'm going to pass it over to Chris Baker, VP of Operations for Homing Consulting. Thank you, Kim. Personally, I'm kind of hoping we get the gyms open because I'm tired of walking circles around where I live, you know. But um, so, so I'm the Vice President of Operations for Hillman Consulting. We're an environmental health and safety firm. And uh, what my position basically means is I'm the guy they come to to solve problems and come up with a practical solution to it. And that started for us when, when COVID came out and we started having people show up who, of course, didn't know it at the time, but they were sick with the, the disease and then we we're helping owners and operators and tenants clean their buildings. And nobody's in those buildings anymore or the occupancy is way down so at this point in the last couple of weeks we've seen a big pivot to reoccupying what is it going to take um, to get people back in my building and I, one of the under, a couple of the underlying points i want to make which is true with all our presentations really is people need to feel confident that it's safe to do this it's they need to feel confident that they can come back to work and, and not become infected. So everything you do, you need to think in that direction. And the other part with that is this whole six foot distancing thing. Um, when we aspire, when we breathe, we normally, normally, you know, you, you, when, you, when you breathe out, you get water droplets that come out. It's not just air, right? And so that will move six feet normally. If I yell, it can go further. If I sneeze or cough, certainly go further. But six feet's really the key because that's like normal respiration, right? So everything you're doing, you want to be considering what does it take to stay on between that six foot social distancing. So, um, but our buildings have been largely empty. Some of them are partially occupied, like my office building is partially occupied. Hillman's critical, so they're still here um, for good and bad. But um, a lot of our buildings have been sitting there kind of empty. So what I'd really like you to do first is go through your space. You need to see what's going on in your space. There's been cutbacks in HVAC to try to reduce costs. There's been cutbacks in housekeeping, again, to try to reduce costs because there's people not there. 
Uh, but probably the pro part of the problem with cutting back on your HVAC is it's not just there to cool or heat you, it's there to dehumidify. And we've been getting warmer. If you've ever had a roof leak or some kind of water leak in the space and you don't have that dehumidification and just normal ventilation, you can start getting condensation. Condensation can lead to mold growth. So you really need to walk through the space just to make sure. Hopefully it's not there, but you know, if that ice maker started to leak and nobody's been there, you might have a larger problem. Make sure things like garbage is picked up. Some of my worst indoor air quality problems have been stuff left in people's desks and it started to stink when they were gone and nobody bothered to win, go through their desk. Um, I've been in spaces where mice are a problem and when people are away, this mice will come out. So you wanna keep it clean. General housekeeping issues. One of the things people don't think about, especially when they haven't been there, is making sure things like floor drains and sink traps have water in them otherwise you start getting odor issues out of them i'm not going to go a whole lot into the hvac because um, tony with our next presentation is going to talk about it but a couple of things you, you do want to make sure is that you have clean filters the coils and fins are being clean uh, cdc is recommending increased outside air uh, one of the things i'll say about increased outside air you know we've kind of switched from the nice green cleaners um, particularly in lead and well buildings. Uh, and now we've switched, right, to disinfectants and, and EPA certified cleaners. And they're not, they give off a lot more odors. Their base ingredients, their active ingredients are things like alcohol and quats. And these leave an odor, these things uh, off gas VOCs. So increasing your outside air will help dilute. We have uh, a little, we have a saying in the environmental business, the solution to pollution is dilution. And uh, while it's kind of cute, it's actually true, whether I'm talking about groundwater contamination or the air quality in your office space, if I can bring in fresh air, I can remove the contaminant. So that's something I, I believe Tony is going to get into, increase your level of filtration. Uh, one of the things that I've already run into is make sure your exhaust systems are operational, particularly in parking garages um, that haven't been used in quite some time. So make sure, if, even if they're automated to CO levels, Make sure they're on, operational. Um, garages, kitchens, bathrooms. I was on a call this morning um, specifically about bathroom issues and the exhaust ventilation is never great to begin with. Make sure we go back through and, and that exhaust is working. Um, one of the things you may want to consider is indoor air quality testing to be able to show to everybody there isn't a problem in their space. Um, that's kind of individual. One of the bigger issues that people don't really think about too much is water within their business, within their building. So, you know, you're going to say, Chris, I get my water from the municipality that supplies me with water. It's chlorinated. You know, it's safe to drink. I'm not really worried about it. But water that sits in a pipe stagnant and doesn't move, it begins to off gas, if you will, that the chlorine or chloramines. And that allows bacteria to start to grow. So water that's been stagnant in your water line system can have bacterial growth, including Legionella, to the point where CDC's even got a specific page set up for this eventuality. And we're starting to see some testing coming back with, with hits on Legionella. So one of the most important things you can do, and, and especially in a gym where you would have showers and such, any kind of hot water system is flush. We need to flush our buildings thoroughly. We need to make we essentially want to replace the water that's in the building now with fresh water from the street. So water that's been sitting there for a long time has the potential. We need to flush it before people come back. If you're a tenant, your owner should be doing most of this. But a lot of tenants install their own water filtration systems that they're responsible for. So be sure you go and change out those filters immediately. And again, flush your fixtures. Uh, that's really important. And then the last part with water is... Um, my middle picture here, this pretty little ornamental that's in the building lobby, um, that is a great way to aerosolize Legionella bacteria and spray it all over the place and get it in the air. So we got to make sure all that water, that system probably hasn't been running some time. We need to make sure it gets drained, everything cleaned, and fresh water that's properly treated back into it so that um, we're not spreading Legionella bacteria that way. Uh, a little bit on cleaning. So you've probably had some introduction to this, some of you more than others, but 
The proper cleaners are identified and EPA is registered list N as in Nancy. You can Google it. It'll take you to a page where you can enter the EPA ID number of your cleaning chemical. And if it shows up, it's good to go. Two things about that. If I enter my number in and it, and it comes up, it may not say Clorox 360. It's gonna say what the active ingredient of Clorox 360 is. That's okay, as long as it comes up, you know it's good. Uh, what's also important on that is um, the contact time that's required. Different chemicals require a different contact time to be effective against the virus. Some are as much as 10 minutes, which means if I spray my desk, it needs to be wet with that chemical for 10 minutes. So obviously finding a chemical um, that has a slower or quicker contact time is beneficial. Um, a lot of these chemicals are, as you might imagine, are back ordered. So um, your cleaning folks, you should be having this dialogue with them now, making sure they're ready to go. We've all heard about enhanced cleaning, high touch points that John mentioned. You know, the ones that are there, we need to be cleaning constantly so that we can't spread something through touch. Um, Part of what you want to do is to find frequency. There's a big difference between my office space and the building lobby, right? Because there's a lot of people coming through the building lobby, a lot more people. So what happens in the lobby and the touch buttons of an elevator need to be cleaned quicker than, than say, just my office door. But you want to define that. You need to go to your cleaning people now because, you know, honestly, it's a change or it's more work for them. Maybe you have a whore, uh, another house porter in the lobby who's doing nothing but cleaning. Um, and reactive cleaning, where COVID is going to be here for a while, obviously until there's a vaccine. So somebody's going to come in who's sick. You've got to be able to respond to that. You got to be able to tell other people in that office that it's safe. And one of those is reactive cleaning. I, I strongly recommend you have somebody kind of lined up now who can take care of that. And then the last part um, is kind of social distancing and masks. And Stacy hit upon a lot of this is like within our office spaces, how are we gonna maintain this six foot? So one, a big push is obviously if somebody's sick or somebody around somebody who is sick, stay home, this hit us here where one of our workers came in and her parents were sick and she just was afraid that she couldn't, you know, she was afraid to miss work. We're like, yeah, but now I have to quarantine three people. So, so really that should be proactive on all HR departments in our opinion. Require face masks if you're out and about. We 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 redid our workspaces. We put little higher partition walls just so people working at the workspace didn't have to wear a face mask when we're walking around. Think about directional traffic flow. Maybe you can make the front door of your suite in only and the hallway side door um, exit only. You know, so we don't have to pass each other on the way. Elevator usage is probably the hottest topic on all these presentations I've done. There is no one answer. You're gonna to have to come up with something creative, um, but we can't put 20 people in an elevator anymore, right? So, and then how do I get people in and off the elevator safely? We gotta maintain distance. I may need to work with my elevator vendor, make sure that door stays open. And I know I'm running late, Laura, so I'll, I'll try to wrap it up. Uh, we wanna de-densify. Uh, that's a big keyword, I, uh, code word I hear with architects. Um, so essentially less people. Maybe I stagger my workforce. Maybe I tell me Baker to work home Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and somebody else come in Tuesday, Thursday. Uh, kitchen cafeteria, she hit. I'm not gonna talk about conference rooms. She did that well. Um, one thing I do wanna bring up, we hotel a lot. We, we share workstations a lot, especially with people who are only in a couple of days a week. It's gonna be on us, the tenant, to make sure we clean those workstations thoroughly between usages. So you need to have wipes. You better start ordering them now because they're all back ordered. Perel has a 16 week back order, a cleaner was telling me the other day. So um, think about that. If I'm in a workstation, I gotta make sure that I clean my workspace when I'm done today. So that when Sherry comes in tomorrow, she cleans it and it's safe for her to work in. Um, things like, think about things like copiers and printers, they need to be cleaned. Think about deliveries. How you, you really don't want outsiders coming in. So I would work with your building manager on how we're gonna deal with vendors. Um, think about the outside. If restaurants are closed and everybody's takeout, where are all these people going? And we want to make sure that they're safe wherever that is. It might be in your courtyard. And then the last thing I wanted to say is signage. Um, you can have a great plan, but if you don't tell people what that is or they don't understand it, it's not going to work. So um, signs are a great way to do that. A lot of the big sign vendors already have packages put together. 
And uh, so start talking to them. And obviously we can help you out wherever you need to. And that's all I got to say about that. So I am going to hand it off to Tony D. Leonardo. And I got it right. And uh, Tony's going to talk about mechanical systems. Thanks, uh, Chris. I'm Tony DiLeonardo, Wick Fisher White, uh, President of Wick Fisher White, and uh, I got to thank crew and thanks um, Laura for hosting this. Let me share the screen with you here. I got a couple uh, slides that I want to present. Everybody see it? Okay. All right, again, thanks a lot. And uh, and uh, Chris touched on it. Well, there's more, more research about um, COVID-19 coming out each day. And Chris uh, talked about when we talk, there seems to be droplets that, that come out and, uh, you know, as far as six feet. And these droplets are large and heavier and uh, most likely to land on surfaces. Uh, we, uh, and not maybe enter the HVAC systems, but there's different schools of thought. But I wanna focus on COVID-19, but also, also all pathogens, you know, to resolve this and uh, to try to provide a, a cleaner environment. So uh, HVAC systems can provide a positive role in infectious spreading. Uh, there's certain strategies uh, in the design of new building uh, HVAC systems that can reduce the spread of buyer aerosols. Uh, should a pathogen become airborne. ASHRAE, which is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, has put together a task force to reduce the risk of infectious aerosols in buildings. Uh, from our experience in design and critical facilities uh, and with recommendations from this task force, there's um, many upgrades, potential upgrades in design uh, that can be performed. Um, like all options, there's pros and cons, and uh, there, they, some might have major cost implications. Uh, facilities should create a plan and budget appropriately for this. Oops. Okay. Uh, so temporary measures like uh, portable filtration, personal ventilation, ionizers may uh, provide minimal help, but can create a false sense of security to building occupants. I know uh, some of our uh, medical office building uh, clients have approached us about this. And they should be aware, first, before purchasing, they should be aware of the capabilities uh, before purchasing them. So all these potential upgrades can be done uh, in addition to like the non-HVC measure, measures, which uh, the social distancing, the disinfecting, and uh, the personal uh, protective equipment to increase outside air ventilation and air change rates in the dist air distribution systems. As Chris mentioned, you know, pollution. Uh, this is potential to limit airborne pathogens transmission through the air. It allows uh, the introduction of more outside air. Uh, an air change rate is a rate that which outside air replenishes the indoor air within a room. Some building operators are opening up that are outside air dampers for additional ventilation. Uh, this is a temporary measure that will ensure air moving quicker and being turned over more often while not allowing any stagnant air for germs to linger. Uh, but you better be cautious because the warmer weather now is coming up and you can't introduce all that uh, warm or hot air because the cooling coils aren't able to handle that. There's specific air change rates that um, ASHRAE recommends, uh, ASHRAE guidelines recommend for facilities. Like clean rooms and hospitals have their own criteria and guidelines that are be followed for to achieve certification or increasing room airflow. Um, Increasing the airflow, I'm sorry, will increase uh, the flow rate in your systems. This would increase potential uh, that bio aerosols will pass through the HVA system and treatment through a, a recommended UVC lighting or a filtration system. Filtration systems, as you'll see in this chart that I have uh, posted, uh, filters MERV, MERV 13 or better can be installed to help reduce particles, dust, and some viruses, uh, but not all HVA systems can handle the additional static pressure. Uh, of an upgraded filter. And most uh, of the better filtrations will not fit into these HVAC systems. Some are four inches thick. Uh, the slide indicates different levels of filtration. Some filters uh, increase static pressure requirements up to like two inches. 
which is uh, causes the decrease in airflow in HVA, existing HVAC systems. So most HVA systems uh, do not have a frame uh, that can handle the increased size for this better filter. Uh, also, you'll you'll see the next slide is um, uh, ultraviolet germicidal ir uh, ir irradiation. Uh, there's UVC light C lighting has the best germicidal effect. Uh, UVC uh, is very effective on inactivating and damaging microorganisms uh, in the air. It is known that UVC can be damaging to the eyes, but typically shields or baffles can be used to avoid direct exposure. Slide shows uh, UVC can be used at a high point of a room to provide some disinfection of air particles. The air would travel by natural convection and ki kill most pathogens in the air. Uh, the diagram shows a UV light direction upward, not shining in any anyone's eyes and located about seven foot uh, above a person's head or above the floor. UV lighting uh, can be used in air handling units as well uh, with filtration. When using an air, air, air handling unit, it typically would be located in the airstream and eliminate mildew and bacteria that may pass through and grow on coils. So, uh, also there's airflow and directional airflow that can create a clean to dirty flow pattern similar to operating rooms and clean rooms. On the one slide you see uh, to the left, most spaces have airflow which mixes to a certain air change rate and goes back to the return air plenum back into the air handling unit. A more directional airflow typical to operating rooms and clean rooms is a single pass airflow pattern at a, at a higher velocity. This flow pattern can move infectious aerosols to uh, exhaust or to the return in a single pass and not have any recirculated air in the room. By exhausting the air, you ensure that the particular uh, particle or the uh, pathogen is sent out of the building or the return air uh, unit and filtered to be filtered or sent through a, a UV uh, light light bulb. You can add exhaust, but be sure that you'll be able to provide the correct amount of outside air makeup air. Uh, exhausting air typically within spaces and uh, are typically done within spaces like lavatories, clean rooms, and hospitals. So also uh, temperature and humidity. There's been some suggested that temperature and humidity can influence a transmission or infectious agent. There's been some uh, analysis of certain airborne infection organisms that can be consider, that considered adding humidity to control the, the uh, humid, humidity control to, uh, to the systems if possible. There was some proof that some microorganisms uh, were decreased with a humidity level range between 40 and 60 percent relative humidity. It would be great cost implications uh, if you add humidifiers including additional maintenance and require, maintenance requirements on the expanded system. And also, uh, I know uh, Chris mentioned, or John mentioned, hands-free plumbing fixtures. This is something that's, uh, I think, going to be in every, every facility these days. But how about the door that uh, everyone goes out and they grab a, a paper towel and they open the door on the way out. So they're going to be automatic doors. So that's something I leave to John to decide. So with uh, numerous upgrades to the building HVAC systems, uh, the facility staff will have their hands full with, you know, workflow, personnel, disinfecting, uh, maybe mo monitoring filters or replacement of filters, monitoring con and controlling temperature and humidity, maintenance of humidifiers. There are also some non-HVAC requirements that operations staff will be performing. Um, this may lead to increased maintenance staff requirements. So this is where commissioning of these systems is crucial. They don't have to worry about the systems if they're commissioned properly. After every renovation or retro commissioning project, there's a need to ensure building systems are operating properly with te proper temperatures, humidity, and pressure relationships are maintained. So uh, my, my outlook on, on the whole thing is, I think disruption caused by the COVID-19 has allowed us to to think differently, to find different ways to be more creative, and, and it's driven us to be more innovative uh, on being safe and productive. Uh, we're looking towards better buildings. Technology has given us the opportunity uh, to provide better reporting data for temperature, humidity, pressure, and ventilation. Uh, we're being forced out of our comfort zones and to utilize different or new technologies. Uh, previously, we've been engineering uh, for better buildings, but now I believe it's gonna be taken 
a little more seriously. I think uh, in commercial real estate community, uh, we can lease spaces and, ba and based on better, cleaner environments. Uh, building location amenities are important to potential buyers or leasing uh, leases, leasers. Uh, businesses leasing space in a building will now be looking at what type of environmental conditions does the building offer? What type of HVAC system? What kind of uh, specific uh, you know, filtration? Do you have airflow diagrams? I mean, these are the type of questions we asked, we just moved last year that we were asking uh, in the building. Uh, so several years back, I know there was sick, sick, uh, sick building syndrome. It was a concern, which made a lot of increases in outside air ventilation. Uh, so I think COVID-19 is going to have the same effect. It's, it's taken us to a new level. Um, currently, uh, real estate personnel and building occupants will be better educated, and I think will reduce the risk of airborne infections through the HVAC systems. Uh, building owners need to restructure priorities, uh, upgrade these systems. The building management systems will be considered not only the healthcare research facilities, but the commercial office buildings, to retail malls, restaurants, and other building with, with that uh, house many occupants. We'll be engineering building systems to ensure or verifying their operation with the commissioning process. We'll be designing better buildings and cleaner environments in the future. So in closing though, my recommendations are put up here on the screen. Um, overview, the HVAC system, provide a risk assessment on whether or not there's an actual concern of the spreading pathogens. Um, uh, if there's a transmission concern is found, provide a solution through a UVC or other treatment options or airflow solutions. Or create a priority plan to implement these better building and cleaner air solutions, and then provide system commissioning services to provide a proper operations of these systems. So on that note, I thank everybody for uh, listening and uh, thank crew as well. And now I'm gonna give you to Nathan Dennis, Target Building Construction. Thank you, Tony. And uh, thanks, uh, Laura, for putting this all together and crew. Uh, I think everybody in the panel has done a great job. Hopefully I can uh, hold my end of the end of this up. Um, my name is Nathan Dennis. I'm the VP of Operations for Target Building. Uh, the majority of our work is hospital health care and higher ed. Um, so on March 12th of this year, our industry changed dramatically. And I think it changed for a lot of people's lives that we were ordered on a Thursday afternoon that Friday was our last day of construction and, the, and everything was gonna be shut down for what they said at that time was two weeks. Um, as you can imagine, on all the hospital projects we were doing, clients, workers, um, everybody was in a panic mode. We needed to tighten up jobs to make sure everything was safe and secure and nobody really knew what the next direction was. By Saturday night, we were informed by the governor changing his status, that all of our hosp hospital and healthcare um, projects were gonna get started. Um, so at that point, we needed to gather our troops on a Sunday and come up with policies and procedures to reopen up our hospital projects. And what we did is basically, we needed to convince the workers that the job sites were gonna be safe, and be able for them to occupy. So this was a huge change, a huge uh, challenge for our safety people, our management people, to come up with these the operations that we had. Um, what we what we put together is from the guidelines from from the government and the CDC of the information they gave us, um, and I'm going to show some pictures of how we established when I share my screen. But I wanted to go through a few things how we establish these safety policies, because we have to understand a few things. Um, our, our subcontractors and all our men work are our assets to us on our jobs. So we need to make sure that they stay in a safe work environment. So what we needed to do, I'm going to try to share this screen and I don't, you know what? I don't have it. Sorry about that, Laura. I don't have my, I have to go, don't have my screen save here. So I'm gonna have to just walk through it. So basically what we did is change our policies and procedures. What we did is set up 
uh, a, a nurse's station in the beginning of the job sites, which was temperature checking of each employee. They all had their masks. The line of the men were six feet long. We had the elevator for vertical transportation that carried up to 12 to 18 men, reduced it down to about six guys per traveling up to 11th and 12th floor. So you can only imagine the amount of time it took to get over 160 guys up the 11th and 12th floor area. Um, the other thing we set up, and I wish I could show you the pictures, we set up temporary sinks on the outside of the areas so that each employee, as they came down, six foot span of sinks, temporary sinks set up so they could wash their hands when they left the site, when they came on the site, just to keep it clean. Um, hand sanitizer was located throughout the site. Target Design has a, a hand sanitizer that they clip to the tool belts they have with them at all times. Um, obviously, we had face masks for everyone at Children's Hospital. They provided us with face masks because at the time there was a shortage of the N95 masks, so we were fortunate enough that they had enough masks for our workers. We had to then basically re-safety train every employee so they understood that they had to wear their mask, use hand sanitizer, try to stay six foot apart. But as you know, in our industry, it's very difficult to stay six foot apart when people are hanging drywall, hanging pipe, uh, they work side by side. So there was a lot of fear with the men and, and convincing them that the work area was gonna be maintained safe. The other, the other thing that was a huge challenge for us with these large projects that really everyone has to think about in the future is break areas, lunch areas, now you're looking at setting up huge areas of either tents or areas that tables can be set six foot apart, single tables. Uh, Children's Hospital was kind enough to continue letting us use their cafeteria, which was a section they broke tables apart, single tables for each individual construction person to sit. So it gave them their space. Um, so they were huge challenges, huge things that we had overcome and the biggest, one of the biggest things you have to remember is while every other industry shut down, the hospital and healthcare industry continued to have construction activities going on. One of the things that I found uh, on a daily basis was uh, the fear from the men because obviously they're going home to their families and they're just like the first responders and nurses and everyone else, they feel that they're in harm's way. Communication with the workers and having them understand what we were doing to protect them was key. And one of the things that I found that, that really helped in the early stages is we had some doctors and nurses talk to the men on the job site to explain how this virus was transmitted. We all know a lot about it now, but in the first couple weeks, we really didn't know what we were up against. Were we getting the truth? Was this, you know, how was this being transmitted? You know, uh, because this is, you know, was catastrophic, uh, in this industry. I've been in this industry for over 40 years and people have said, you know, younger guys have come up to me, well, what happened when this happened before? I said, this has never happened before where they have shut projects down uh, because of this. Um, so it was a concern to everybody. So I think with, you know, doctors and nurses explaining the construction guys instead of management, who in, the, in their mind was just trying to get a project done, was very helpful to keep them uh, safe and secure so that they knew that they were working in a safe environment. You know, I know everybody in this panel, this is going to be with us for a long time. It, it, it's not going to change. This is one virus. There's always, there always could be a threat of another virus. I, I firmly believe that these masks are going to stay with us on the construction site, just as OSHA came in and instituted other safety precautions on, on safety glasses, hard hats, you know, tie down, all these things, this, it's just gonna be, I think, um, one more thing that stays within the industry um, to keep, continue to keep the men safe from that standpoint. So, you know, from a future standpoint, you know, from, from, a, from a contracting and pricing standpoint, we as, as contractors and the owners need to look at, uh, there's gonna be costs associated with this. Um, on these projects, just with the way you're going to set up, the more square footage, the more lay down area, your logistics of job sites are going to change dramatically if you have, you know, 200 guys, where are these guys going to sit and eat? So now you've got to think about all these strategies um, and how they're going to be handled. So the, the only other um, 
a few other things that I wanted to talk about. One of the things that came to us today, um, they have just instituted, and there's a couple of projects that I've heard in the city already that um, they're gonna, they have hard hats that have basically uh, like a low jack system and everybody gets them attached to their hard hat. So if you're within six feet of somebody, it documents it. And if that person does test positive, this then will can alert everyone that was with him in his area um, that this person was has tested positive. Um, so that's you know new technologies coming out. The other challenge we had is our, our office needed to reopen because you know with all the hospital and healthcare work we were doing, so we needed to go on shift work here in the office on, on project managers on certain days. A lot of people from working home, but same thing that, that the panel was talking about on how we had to make conference rooms now offices and separate people and move people around. So so you know these were these were challenges that we went through. The 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 only the, the other thing is uh, from our construction the, the scheduling planning and, and logistics will change drastically. There will be much more uh, second shift third shift work to keep the manpower down, and you know these are things that have costs to them also that you need to recognize when you're in a tight time schedule with university work when you're doing it through the summer and they expect everything to be done in 13 weeks and you're not allowed to have more than you know, a certain amount of people in a certain square footage, you're gonna need to have second, third, third shift so that you can get all this work completed in a timely manner. Uh, I apologize, my slides weren't working, they were good, um, but these were a few of the things that, that I just wanted to touch on um, from where we are in this industry and what's happening. But once again, I think that this isn't gonna change the construction industry always is facing change. Everybody on this panel faces change every day. This is just another challenge we have to overcome and adjust to. And people do that. As we all see, we've already started to adjust, already started to relax and calm down, handle the rules and regulations that are coming out to continue working and, and get everything to what is gonna be the new normal. Um, and we will adjust to that and things will get back to normal. And, uh, we'll all be back, at, as John said, having our happy hours instead of the virtual. So I, I am looking forward to those days and uh, we can do these things in person instead of on, on, online like they are right now. So um, thank you again for having me and I greatly appreciate it. Hopefully I give some insight on some of the things that we're doing um, to make, continue to keep our workers safe. So Laura, I'll turn it back over to you and thank you so much. Well, thank you again uh, very much, Nathan, and, and thank you to all of our other panelists. I am ever grateful for uh, your nimbleness in the beginning of this event, uh, as well as uh, just agreeing to, to be a part of this and to help us all open up those uh, channels of communication around these uncertain times. Uh, so we did receive one question. I know we are, thankfully, uh, we did a lot some time at the end for questions. Uh, so we are not running over on our time, but we did receive one question for uh, John Lister. And uh, it says, with the economic implications of the last three months and possibly the next three months, how are your clients balancing COVID issues and sustainability issues with their budget? Um, it's definitely going to be at least three months come looking forward and probably more like the rest of your lifetime looking forward, uh, honestly. So um, most of our clients are, uh, are just what you're, look, what you're reading in the paper, which is who's paying rent, who's not paying rent, where's their revenue, you know, how are we paying, uh, how, are we, how are we sustaining our business? When it comes to uh, balancing the needs and priorities of sustainability and COVID, um, you know, COVID obviously is a life and, life and death and it's urgency. It's a matter of setting priorities and urgency, uh, based on urgency. Sustainability remains at a higher, at a priority. It's growing actually, much like I was referring to in my, in my conversation or my uh, long-winded uh, presentation. Uh, and then budget is, you know, budget is always there. It's regardless of uh, good times, bad times, there's always a budget and I'm um, always trying to make the most of it. So, um, I guess to directly answer your question, it's it's a very much a balancing act that everybody is still figuring out. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, John, and uh, thank you to all of our participants. Again, apologies uh, for some of the technical difficulties that we experienced in the beginning. Uh, but as I mentioned, the recording will be sent out to everyone, uh, hoping by the end of the week. And um, so then that way you can kind of catch up on anything that was missed or um, refresh any memories that you have. And as always, you can reach us on social media or by emailing crewphiladelphia at gmail.com. And we can, um, we can answer any questions that you might have that way afterwards. So thank you all again so much for your time. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists. I hope that you all stay safe, stay healthy, uh, as well as your loved ones and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Happy Memorial Day weekend as well. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone.